Shalom, brothers and sisters. It is a blessing to come before you once again. I give all honor, glory, and praise unto the Most High, the Lord God of Israel. So we are continuing on reading in this book of Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Make sure you do have your Bibles out, a pen and paper, that you may follow along and take notes. So here in this book of Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 1 reads, for all this I considered in my heart, even to declare all this, that the righteous and the wise and their works are in the hand of God. No man knoweth either love or hatred by all that is before them. Okay, so it is God who determines the times. It is God who determines all things. Verse 2, all things come alike to all. There is one event to the righteous and to the wicked, to the good and to the clean, and to the unclean, to him that sacrifices and to him that sacrifices not. As is the good, so is the sinner, and he that swears as he that feareth an oath. We're going to find out what this one event is that comes to all. Verse 3. This is an evil among all things that are done under the sun, that there is one event unto all. Yea, also the heart, meaning their mind, of the sons of men is full of evil, and madness, meaning wickedness, is in their heart, it's in their mind while they live. And after that, they go to the dead. Okay, and so before we read verse 4, uh, what I want to discuss with you is um, something the most high it placed on my mind, you know, that God does not see as man sees, okay? So it is not about the size, uh, age, physical appearance, or status of, you know, an animal or a man, okay? And so when you read about men and women in the Bible, you first start out reading where they started from. Uh, just like King David, you know, he started out as a shepherd um, and later he would go on to not uh, continue, you know, leading animals like physical sheep, but to lead his people, God's people, uh, being the Israelites who are called sheep in the Bible. And Moses, you know, when he fled um, into Midian and he were there um, being a shepherd, leading the sheep. God would then later on use Moses to lead his people, uh, being the Israelites, God's people, out of Egypt, out of captivity. So they would both go on uh, to do great things, okay? And not only uh, King David and uh, Moses, but other men and, men and women in the Bible, you'll see that God used them to do great things. So in 1 Samuel chapter 16, when uh, David was anointed to be king, I'm going to just read two verses from this uh, 1 Samuel chapter 16. Hold your place there in Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Again, I want to show you something before we read verse 4 of Ecclesiastes chapter 9, that God does not see as man sees. 1 Samuel chapter um, 16, verses 6 through 7. And you can go back and read, you know, the entire uh, chapter. This is when uh, Samuel had caused uh, Jesse's sons, his seven sons, to pass before him. Okay, God had placed it on his mind. Um and then it were chosen and decided that it would be David, being the youngest son, who would become king and who would be anointed. So in 1 Samuel chapter 16, again, I'm only going to read these two verses, verse 6 and 7. And it reads, And it came to pass when they were come, that he looked on Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. Verse 7, But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance, meaning don't look at his physical appearance that you see, or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. 
For the Lord sees not as man sees. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Okay? And that is so true, you know. Um, God does see our heart. He sees our minds. Uh, he's not focused on the outward appearance like men, mankind is. Okay? And even when it comes to an animal, you know, some people will see a lion for its beauty, for its strength right? Um, for its renown and how it's known as being king of the jungle. And then when you're comparing a lion to that of a dog, um, you know, you won't see the same uh, qualities or features as you would in a lion. So again, God does not see as man sees, okay? But God does look at the heart of a man, and I had mentioned uh, Samson, you know, in a prior video, I was talking about, you know, how his physical appearance, it may have not been what they do portray him as. Um, you know, they didn't have any gyms or weight rooms back in the biblical days of antiquity. But every picture that you see of Samson, you will see that he's got muscles, right? His physical uh, physique, his appearance is that of a bodybuilder, the way that they portray him. But we don't know what his appearance uh, would have been. What we do know from reading the word of God is that God did give him superhuman strength and used him to do great things. And even when reading about the life of King Solomon, you know, for all of his wives, concubines, virgins, uh, all the women that he had, King Solomon is not described as the most beautiful man in the Bible. In the scriptures, it were his brother Absalom, who was the third son of King David uh, by his wife, Makkah. And 2 Samuel chapter 14 uh, lets us know this. So let's turn there. Again, I'm just putting something on your mind before we read Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 4. Um, let's turn to 2 Samuel chapter 14, verse 25 through 26. 2 Samuel chapter 14, verse 25 through 26. And keep in mind, you know, God looks at the heart. Okay. So in 2 Samuel chapter 14, 25 through 26, and it reads, but in all Israel, there was none to be so much praised as Absalom for his beauty, from the sole of his foot, even to the crown of his head, from foot up to his head, head to, um, you know, as they would say, instead of head to toe, we're looking at the feet all the way up to his head. Even to the crown of his head, there was no blemish in him. Verse 26, and when he pulled his head, meaning when he shaved it, for it was at every year's end that he pulled it because the hair was heavy on him. Therefore, he pulled it. He weighed the hair of his head at 200 shekels after the king's height. Okay. And so he was um, to be praised for his beauty. This was Absalom. But seeing how many wives, concubines, virgins that King Solomon had, uh, many would be made to believe that he was the most beautiful uh, man, as said in the Bible. But no, it were actually his brother Absalom. Okay. So again, I just want to put something on your mind to let you know, um, you know, that God does not see as man sees. Even for all the beauty of Absalom, you go on and you read about him and you'll see he ended up getting... Um, hanged by his own hair, you know, uh, he were an evil, wicked man. And so let's continue on in this Ecclesiastes um, chapter 9. Okay, and now we can read verse 4. And it says, For to him that is joined to all the living there is hope, for a living dog is better than a dead lion. Okay, so the living dog is still alive, right? And it can go on to be of great use, unlike a lion who is dead. So when you read 
uh, down to verse 5 and 6 of this Ecclesiastes chapter 9, it says, For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Neither have they any more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Also their love, their hatred, their envy is now perished. Neither have they any more portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. So again, a dog that is still alive can be of great use, unlike a lion who is dead. Although he would be considered a king of the jungle, right? His roar would be no longer heard once he's dead. And that dog who is still alive, his bark would be heard. You see, so this is a proverb, this verse 4 in Ecclesiastes chapter 9. And what is a proverb? A proverb is a saying, okay? And so um, there have been many great men and women in the Bible we can read about, you know, our ancestors, and God used them to do great things. But then there came a time where um, that breath of life were taken from them, and they die, they return back into the dust from which they were formed. But then those of us who are still alive, we can still be used by God, no matter our age, no matter our appearance, no matter our status, we can still be used by God because we are still living, we are still alive. We are still here under the sun on this earth to make a difference in the lives of men, women, and children, spreading the truth of this gospel, this word of God, this good news. Okay, and so now I'm reading further in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 7 reads, Go thy way, eat thy bread with joy, and drink thy wine with a merry heart, for God now accepteth thy works. Let thy garments be always white, and let thy head lack no ointment. And these um, garments being white, you can read in Revelation chapter 3, verse 4. It symbolizes the righteous acts of the saints. And this ointment uh, that you are not to let your head lack any of is the word of God. You continuously keep this oil um, you know, poured upon your head which is into your mind, okay? That is the, um, the oil, the ointment that you want to keep, um, you know, is the word of God. And so verse nine, it reads, live joyfully with the wife whom thou lovest all the days of the life of thy vanity, which he has given thee under the sun all the days of thy vanity, for that is thy portion in this life, and in thy labor which thou takest under the sun. So whatever it is the Most High has blessed you with, whether it is a wife or, um, you know, he's blessed you with the fruits of the labor um, from all of your work that you do, you know, enjoy that. Um, take pleasure in that because that is what God has given you. Okay, he has given each and every one of us something different, right? Our lives are not all the same. Some of our brothers and sisters, they are married and others are not. But nevertheless, uh, God is our husbandman. Okay, he is married unto us. We are the bride, the wife of Christ. And that is why it is said in that book of songs, Song of Solomon, return, return, O Shulamite. It, I-T-E, means descendant of, and Shulam, I believe that's saying Shalom, of peace, Prince of Peace, return. And what will you see in the Shulamite? You will see as if it were the company of two armies, his bride, both northern and southern kingdom, Israelites, the 12 tribes. You will see us um, returning with Christ at his second coming. Okay, and now uh, verse 10, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave where thou goest. 
So again, whatever it is that God has given you, uh, whatever talents and gifts he might have blessed you with, you know, do it with your might. And not only um, don't do it unto men, but do it unto God. You want um, whatever it is that you're doing to be pleasing in the sight of God. And there's nothing better to do in this life under this sun than spreading this truth, this word of God. Because this is going to help uh, win and save souls, this word of God. Okay, so labor for the most high. We need more laborers in the vineyard. You know, I often think about the many books there are in the Bible and how we could all be reading um, different books from the Bible, gaining understanding, but it has to be the most high that does place it on your heart, on your mind, to get to work, to start building our people spiritually, the kingdom of God. So verse 11 says, I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill, but time and chance happen to them all. So again, it doesn't matter what your status is, you know, what kind of clout you have or what name and title and position and all those things, at the end of it all, the Most High determines your time. He determines when your breath would be taken from you, okay? That is something, a battle, um, a war that you cannot win. <clears throat> As we've read in the previous chapter, there's no discharge in that war. You're not going to get out of... <clears throat> You're not going to get out of death when it is your time to leave this earth. You just want to make sure that you have, um, you know, feared God. You've kept his commandments, kept the faith in Jesus. You've loved your brother and sister as yourself. And as the gospel song, um, you know, that once said, may the work I've done speak for me. You let the things you've done and said on this earth speak for you. And so verse, um, and also, you know, when Jesus came, <clears throat> he would go to the fishermen and he gave the father's word to them, you know, to the fishermen, to the tax collectors. He didn't go to the scribes and Pharisees because he couldn't work with them. They were so full of old wine, which is traditions and commandments of men, that no new wine could be poured into them. No new teachings, the truth of God's word, because they were full of that old wine. So that is something to think about, too. And then uh, the Messiah would teach the disciples. You know, um, he told them, he said, come and follow me. And so at first, you know, uh, two of them, they were fishermen, right? But then they started following after Jesus, the Messiah, and he taught them how to become fishers of men. And so I'm saying all this because I want to show you um, the spiritual meaning of that. Okay, you know, what is greater to be a fisherman uh, fishing for the physical food that would nourish um, men's bodies physically? You know, they would get full eventually later on in their lives they would end up giving up the breath of life. Again, returning to the dust from which they were formed because we all have a time we are given on this earth under the sun. Or is it greater to be a fisherman of men to give them the bread of heaven, this word of God that would save their souls, um, you know, so that they can gain eternal life. You know, I would say to become a fisherman of men would be that of, of great importance, okay? And so uh, hopefully that did make sense, but let's continue on. Um, again, verse 11 says, I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill, but time and chance happeneth to them all. And now verse 12, 
For man also knows not his time as the fishes that are taken in an evil net and as the birds that are caught in the snare. So are the sons of men snared in an evil time when it falleth suddenly upon them. So just as you have fish when they're caught up in a net, right? They don't know they're about to be caught. And when they are caught up, you see them flopping around trying to survive and gasp for air. The same thing with birds. They start flapping their wings trying to escape. Well, when it's your time to give up the breath of life, you don't know when it's going to suddenly fall upon you. And no matter how much you kick, scream, roll, um, try to prolong and hang on, when it's your time to go, you got to go. That breath of life will be taken from you. So again, as that song once said, may the work I've done speak for me. You let the things you've done and said in this life under this sun, let it matter, let it count, let it be that which is pleasing in the sight of God. Let the things you do be done unto God, not unto men. And now verse 13. This wisdom have I seen also under the sun, and it seemed great unto me. So King Solomon, who is the preacher speaking, you know, once the Most High had come to him by night in a dream, and he um, granted him that request to give him wisdom. Once King Solomon, being the preacher, experience this wisdom this word of God he says it seemed great unto me and so verse 14 now we're going to read into a parable and what is a parable it is a short story with the spiritual meaning so verse 14 there was a little city and few men within it and there came a great king against it and besieged it and built great bulwarks against it. Verse 15, now there was found in it a poor wise man, and he by his wisdom delivered the city, yet no man remembered that same poor man. And so remember in chapter seven of Ecclesiastes in verse 19, where it was saying wisdom um, is better than strength. You know, I do believe that this poor wise man spoke of here is the Messiah, is Jesus. Okay, King Solomon was a prophet. And um, when you're reading throughout the Bible, um, let's, let's turn to uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 4 and 14 again. Okay, Ecclesiastes chapter 4 and 14. That way I'm not just talking and we can actually read here in Ecclesiastes chapter 4 and 14. For out of prison he cometh, or back up in 13, excuse me, Ecclesiastes chapter 4 verses 13 through 14. Better is a poor and wise child than an old and foolish king who will no more be admonished. For out of prison he cometh to reign, where is also he that is born in his kingdom becometh poor. So God, being the most high, set aside his godhood to come in this flesh and blood body. So he set aside his royalty, right, to become poor, less than being in this uh, flesh and blood body when he came. And they asked the question, in the book of John, chapter 1, can anything good come out of Nazareth? So John, chapter 1, 45 through 48. Turn to John, chapter 1, verse 45 through 48. And it reads, Philip findeth Nathanael and saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip saith unto him, Come and see. Okay, and you go on and you read. Let's go on and read. Um, I'm in First John chapter 1. We'll read verse 47 and 48 also. Jesus saith, Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him, and saith of him, 
Behold, an Israelite indeed, and whom is no guile. Nathanael saith to him, Whence knowest thou me? How do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, Before that Philip called thee, when you were under the fig tree, I saw thee. You see, so something good did come out of Nazareth, even though today would Nazareth, um, back in that time, they might have considered Nazareth to have been of less worth, but something good did come out of it. It was our King, our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Okay, and again, I believe he is this poor man that is spoken of here in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 14 and 15 in this parable that did deliver the city by his wisdom, okay? So it were not only coming out of Egypt that um, God, who back then was known as Jehovah, right, um, who would have delivered the city, but he also delivered the city by his wisdom, by the same poor man's wisdom, he delivered the city. Even when you're reading on throughout the book of Judges, all the men and women God may have used um, to deliver the city during the book of Judges and the time during the Judges, it were by this poor man's wisdom. It were by God's wisdom that he placed in man, in his heart, to know how to go about delivering the city. They didn't do it on their own. That wisdom came from up above. It came from this poor wise man, you see. And when you're reading in the book of Esther, um, you know, Haman's wicked plot, it was by this same poor man's wisdom that's been here all along from the beginning, God's wisdom that was placed in um, Esther that told her how to go about and to delivering her people from Haman's wicked plot and plan. Okay, and so um, all of the apostles and the prophets, uh, they spoke of a future deliverance from captivity, of us being delivered in the future. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and so forth. By this poor man's wisdom, by God's wisdom, he will deliver the city, us being the Israelites, the 12 tribes once again. Even when you're reading into the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it will be the same poor man's wisdom, God's wisdom. Okay, the father sending his word into his son, uh, Jesus being the Messiah. And he would tell us plainly, you know, how often would I have gathered you, right? As a hen does gather her broad under her wings, but you would not, right? They refused him, his own people. He came into his own and his own received him not. This poor man's wisdom, they rejected and refused many of Judah being his own people, okay? But again, it is by his counsel, his knowledge, his understanding, this word of God that was despised by many of his own and not heard, not paid attention to. Uh, yet to those who had believed on his word, he gave them power to become the sons of God. Okay. So it is um, this poor man's wisdom that was able to deliver the city time and time again, and he will do it again in the future. Okay. And so uh, let's read in the book of... Um, Let's see, Mark chapter 6, verse 2 through 3. Again, hold your place there in Ecclesiastes chapter 9. We're going to read Mark chapter 6, verse 2 through 3. Okay. So we'll, oh, yeah. I'm in Matthew. Hold on, brothers and sisters. Turn to Mark chapter 6, verse 2 through 3. And it reads, And when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue, being the Messiah. 
And many hearing him were astonished, saying, From whence has this man these things? How does he know all of this knowledge, all of this wisdom? From whence hath this man these things? And what wisdom is this which is given unto him, that even such mighty works are wrought, are done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and of Judah and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. And verse 14 also, But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country, and among his own kin, and in his own house. Okay? So again, this poor man's wisdom, God's counsel, his word, he came to deliver the city, but they would not. They uh, rejected and refused him, even had him delivered over to be crucified, their own king, their own Lord and Savior. And so um, many a times by this poor man's wisdom, again, did he deliver the city. No matter how many, um, you know, bulwarks being strong, military might and power came against it. God placed his wisdom, the poor man's wisdom, his word into the hearts and minds and showed those judges how to deliver his people, showed and instructed Moses how to bring them through the Red Sea, showed unto the prophets the vision and let them know that it is for an appointed time that he will once again deliver us being this city, the Israelites, the 12 tribes scattered worldwide. And so um, let's continue on. And again, um, you know, I just want to go ahead and expound. It were that same poor man's wisdom that, um, you know, was sent unto the Apostle Paul. Even though at one point he persecuted the church, he would then send his wisdom into the Apostle Paul, putting him on the right path and instructing him of how to go to those Israelites that were scattered abroad in the diaspora, also known as Gentiles. Uh, they were called Gentiles. They were called unclean and uncircumcised by those children of Judah. He would send to go to them, um, you know, those that were in Rome, those that were in Corinth, those that were in Galatia and Ephesus and Philippi and Thessalonica to deliver his city by this poor man's wisdom, by his word. Okay. And so, um, again, brothers and sisters, I do believe this poor man's wisdom is the word of God. And many a times did our God um, send you know, men to tell us, thus saith the Lord God, even to this very day, trying to deliver us uh, from this captivity. Uh, first, he has to um, place his word into our hearts and minds that we may start being obedient and no longer disobedient children, but obedient children, paying attention, paying heed, taking heed to this poor man's wisdom to this word of God, that he may deliver us in the future at the appointed time to come, the 12 tribes. So now in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 15, it says, Now there was found in it a poor wise man, and he by his wisdom delivered the city, yet no man remembered that same poor man. So I say to you today, remember the word of God, who is this poor wise man you remember his word you hold on to this poor man's wisdom this word of god it's going to be what will save you in the end it's going to be by god's word his grace and his mercy that we enter into the kingdom of god that is to come verse 16 then said i wisdom is better it is better than strength Nevertheless, the poor man's wisdom is despised and his words are not heard. So we need to take heed and listen to 
the poor man's wisdom. Listen to this word of God. Have ears to hear, have eyes to see. And those of us who can see, who can hear, we need to lead the others. Be their eyes for them. You be their hands for them. You see and be their ears for them. You hear, okay, and share with your brothers and sister the things that you can see and the things you can hear. And verse 17, the words of wise men are heard and quiet more than the cry of him that ruleth among fools. And isn't that the truth? You know, um, the radio, television, all of this esoteric knowledge we are hearing um, constantly every day, that's heard more. That voice is louder than the voice of those speaking truth. So we must continue to speak this word of God, continue to cry aloud and spare not that our voice, that God's voice, his word may be heard. Because it's not our own word, but it is this poor man's wisdom. It is the word of God that needs to go forth, that needs to be heard. Verse 18, wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroyeth much good. Okay, and isn't that the truth? You know, our ancestors, they disobeyed. And here we are, their children today, in captivity. And it has been a continued, repeated cycle. Again, when you're reading throughout the book of Judges, you see they were in and out of captivity. But thank God, all praises to the Most High. This is our last captivity. And um, that's all that I had, brothers and sisters. Again, uh, do not despise this poor man's wisdom. Do not despise this word of God, but receive this word of God. And you go on and you share this word of God with others. And I pray that, um, you know, you have gotten some understanding. Again, this is what has been shown into me. And the more that we read, the more we study the word of God, I believe the Most High is going to continuously uh, pour out his spirit upon us. Uh, that way we're able to understand the things that we do read. And if any of your brothers and sisters have feedback, uh, maybe the Most High has shown you something else regarding this chapter nine, I would like to know, you know, um, and I apologize if I'm not able to answer each and every comment, but know that um, you are always on my heart, my mind, my brothers and sisters, and I do love you, and I continue to study the Word of God. God bless. Shalom.